Hello, and welcome to the Atlas Project. This is episode 25. We are discussing tonight part three, chapter five, which is called Their Brother's Keepers. Uh, my name is Ben Baer. I'm a fellow with the Ayn Rand Institute. Uh, with me in New York, who will be joining shortly, is Greg Salmieri. And I'll just start off with a few reminders uh, about what this project does. We are a weekly chapter-by-chapter -chapter reading group. Uh, we're talking about Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. And if you're just dropping by for the first time, you should know I've put some links in the comment section for this Facebook post uh, with more information on the Atlas Project about how you can uh, listen to recordings of past chapters if you want to catch up. Uh, we're almost done with the book, but uh, and you may not be with us. Uh, if so, don't you know? Be careful because there's spoilers <laughs> coming up tonight. But uh, there's also information in the comment section about the essay contest, which uh, is uh, a contest sponsored by the Ayn Rand Institute about Atlas Shrugged. You can win up to ten thousand dollars by entering, and we're certainly trying to encourage more people to do that. That's part of the reason that we're doing this project. Um, so that's the main reminder that I have. I think Greg has an announcement he'd like to make before I come back and give a summary of this week's chapter. Greg? Yeah, just uh, one announcement, which is that next week when we're discussing chapter six of part three, I will not be doing it here from New York. So I'm sorry to the New York audience that I'll uh, miss you guys then. But I'll be uh, in Boston. And uh, for uh, I know there's a, a group gathered uh, that's going to be part of that broadcast there. If there's anybody who's uh, watching this now who's not part of that group, uh, you can join um, Facebook groups Atlas Project Boston or just uh, we'll, we'll make an event that's visible in the Atlas Project group in general so you can sign up to get admitted to that. But we'll be doing it from Boston. Then the following week I'll be back here in New York and we'll be talking about uh, Chapter 7, which we're doing a, uh, a two-week-long discussion of because it's a quite a substantial chapter. Uh, so that's uh, what I have by way of announcements. Ben, do you want to take us through just a, a summary of the chapter, and then we'll uh, get going in earnest? Yeah, so this chapter divides into roughly three major, uh, sorry, four major sections. Uh, first, a series of Dagny-focused scenes, then some Reardon-focused scenes, then back to Dagny concerning Minnesota, uh, and then back to New York uh, in the Taggart Terminal. Uh, at the beginning, when there's the focus on Dagny, we are immediately told about the copper shortage, about how Dagny is shuffling copper from one Taggart transcontinental station to the other in response to various breakdowns. Um, that is uh, something that's going to connect to the very end of the chapter, which we'll get to eventually. Um, while this is happening, she's observing the results of the uh, railroad, the so-called railroad unification plan. She's observing that uh, because this Cuffy Meg's character is in charge, lots of different businesses who need transportation are having to jockey for what they call transportation pull if they want to get any service at all. And whether they do depends on uh, how buddy buddy they are with Cuffy. Um, as she's uh, negotiating with Jim uh, at one point in conversation, uh, he's brought her to. Uh, have a conversation, but then he says he needs to hear he needs her to hear a, a certain radio broadcast. At which point they hear the broadcast and they learn the news of the destruction of the Danconia Copper Company, which has come just on the occasion that the company was about to be nationalized by the country of Chile. Um, after this, at dinner with Reardon, um, they talk about how Reardon is trying to save Minnesota. Uh, the harvest is coming. And uh, there's been a bumper crop, but uh, it's not clear that, there's, uh, that, that the crop is going to get to where it needs to go. Um, and at this point, they see Francisco's basically parting message to the world. Uh, just as he's destroyed his company, he's also disappeared. And it's the famous brother you've asked for it, which has some important connections, I think, to the title of the chapter. Um, then we get to the Reardon-focused scenes. And uh, Reardon's brother, Philip, has shown up again. He's asking for a job. Uh, Reardon rebuffs him. Then Reardon is uh, at the divorce proceedings with Lillian. Uh, he's basically paid off all the relevant parties, and he's watching this happen, uh, desperately trying to get out of that marriage, which, which has uh, lost its value to him for a long time. And then we, uh, we see it. There's a brief scene with the wet nurse where, unlike Philip, we, uh, Reardon wishes that he could give a job to the wet nurse. 
Then we find uh, out what happens in Minnesota. Basically, Dagny discovers that the uh, Taggart, term, Taggart transcontinental cars have not been sent for the harvest. Cuffey has sent them to Louisiana, uh, where uh, the dregs of the nation often end up. Uh, and as a result, the harvest is lost. Finally, we go back to New York uh, in a meeting with the chief looters. Dagny learns that one last copper wire has broken at the Taggart terminal, breaking the signaling system. Uh, and she has to devise a signal a system for manually signaling the trains with lanterns. When she's telling the workers about the plans to do this, she notices John Galt in the crowd, where apparently he has been a lowly track laborer all these many years. Uh, they depart for the tunnel uh, where his motor has been stored. They, they finally consummate their love, and he returns to work uh, to hold a lantern for this system that she's devised. That, I think, uh, sums up the major issues, Greg. Uh, and I forgot whether you mentioned in this broadcast that you're from Louisiana uh, or not. If not, people might think you're just disparaging the state willy-nilly. Well, I'm, I'm in Louisiana. Yeah, rather you, you now live in Louisiana, yes. Um, I, it was, drawn it was there more by their, mock self-disparagement. Yeah. Drawn there by their crop of soybeans or for some other reason? Anyway. Not for the food at uh, all. All right. Um, good. So what I think we're going to do tonight is we're going to start by talking a little bit about the events of the chapter from a national and world scale. Uh, so not particularly what's going on with Daphne or Reardon, except insofar as what's going on with the country and how they, uh, they relate to this and what's going on with the world. And then we'll zoom in first on Reardon and then on Daphne. And uh, the zooming in on Daphne will, will end us with uh, Daphne's final scene in the chapter, which is um, the love scene and conversation with Galt, which is a pleasant place to end and is where the chapter ends. Okay, so let's begin with the, the econ oh, I should also mention, I'm, I'm a bit ill tonight, so you'll see me sucking on cough drops and wheezing and so forth. Um, so let's start, though, with the state of Taggart Transcontinental and what we can learn from the state of Taggart Transcontinental about the state of the nation. Uh, what's going on in this first scene with, uh, in this first scene? We find out about a, some, copper, um, some copper wire that breaks uh, and about a number of other disasters and problems. What's the message that we can take away from this first sequence? Any thoughts, locals in New York? Or, yeah, Robert? Well, copper is becoming a it's running out. There, there's nobody producing it. Nobody has it. So Dagny's going into stock of wherever she has it. She's scrambling to send it to whatever place needs right. it most desperately. And in this particular case, it's a copper mine, right? Copper ore, but they don't have the copper wire there to keep their equipment running. And so Dagny's having to send her copper wire all over the place. And it's always half the stock from here to there, right? Never getting any new ore. Yeah, carry on. And that uh, it's ironic that the whole system is hanging by a copper wire thread that wears uh, thin until uh, Francisco makes sure that the last of it snaps. Yeah. Ben, you had some, some thoughts on this, I know. Well, I think it's interesting to observe the kind of overall pattern of uh, what happens with the wire uh, over the course of the chapter. So it starts with there's an accident in California. An, a, a, a copper wire breaks on a Taggart uh, lo, uh, communications line caused just by a single drop of water, interestingly. Um, I mean, this, this company's hanging by a thread. Uh, and so uh, copper from Montana is sent to California. Then there's a breakdown in Montana, and they send copper from Minnesota. Then there's a breakdown in Minnesota, and they send uh, copper from New York. And what then ends up happening is that throughout the whole chapter, we see each of the places that Dagny sends the wire ends up either being looted or destroyed anyway. Uh, after she sends the wire to California, they put a tax on the oil companies in California, who's, yeah, and they're the ones that she wanted to save. Um, after she sends the copper to Montana, uh, this happens around the same time as Danconia copper collapses, and so the government nationalizes all the copper in the country, and she says that's the end of Montana. Uh, she sends the copper to Minnesota, and then because of uh, the events that we're going to talk about shortly, um, the crop 
uh, rots before it can even be looted because there's not been any transportation sent there. And so that state is, if not completely dead, at least close to being. And then, of course, uh, when the copper wire breaks in New York, there's nobody left to get any further copper from. That was the that was the last place they were sending it from. And so, I mean, all along, it looks like what's happening is Dagny is inadvertently, I think, helping the looters to drain the producers that she's helped. She saves the state temporarily to the point where somebody can then go in and pounce on it. Um, and I mean, it's even clearer in the cases where she's she's not the one making the decisions directly. I mean, there's a brief story told about the relationship between Falkton, Nebraska, and Sand Creek, Illinois, where um, the uh, Falkton is... Ben, your sound is gone. Your video is still here, and everything else seems fine, but you've gone quiet. Um... Let me ah now your sound is back. Still? Yes, you, your sound disappeared briefly. Okay, and I, now it's back. Know what happened? Uh, you were well, talking about the two the... the two towns. Yeah. So real real briefly, the steel gets sent from Nebraska to Illinois. Then Illinois the Illinois town uh, collapses anyway, uh, and so they send the seed grain from Nebraska uh, to Illinois. And uh, I mean, so each time the more productive. Uh, place is being sacrificed to a less productive place. And still Dagny's, I mean, basically helping them doing this because uh, she's the one who's, you know, running the trains uh, that are that are aiding in the draining. And she, she herself is stepping back, looking at the map, thinking these used to be uh, lines uh, that gave life to the country, but now they're lines that are that are being used to suck the life out of the, the most productive places. One way traffic, consumers traffic, right? And we also get a lot of, I mean, we're seeing a lot happening in this, in this first sequence. We're learning about all these cars that are rerouted, right? They're rerouted by Coffee Megs, who sends them to carry the Smathers Brothers grapefruit and other um, things that of people who have political pull. Um, is the political pull exactly friendship with Megs? Well, earlier we're told that, um, you know, maybe it's paying him off, but... Uh, maybe it's blackmailing him or blackmailing other people like him who have control. Um, another thing we're observing, right, is that Megs is stealing from the railroad directly. He's the one that stole the copper that was meant to be delivered to them. So he's looting the railroad in a very short-sighted way. And you get to see a little later in the chapter the way he thinks about this, right? When they're talking about what states to leave uh, transportation to and what states to remove it, he talks about certain states being picked dry and other ones where there's plenty of pickings left. So this whole idea of pickings, you know, you go and you grab stuff, like, um, you know, in this scavenger vulture-like way, you grab what's there to be taken, not you make anything. Whereas Dagny's perspective is on what states are able to produce, right? And where are things being produced and how can we produce? Um, but Megs is picking the railroad dry by stealing and, and selling off their... Uh, equipment whenever he can get away with it. And he's also um, diverting their trains for other people who are functioning in the same manner. Uh, another thing I think we see in this, um, there are a few other things I think we see in, the, in these first sections. One is the mindlessness of the Taggart employees, right? They're not, um, some of them are dumb or indifferent, and others who aren't are having to pretend to be, and nobody can tell which is which, right? Because whenever anything bad happens, um, what you get punished for is bringing to light the problem. And so nobody wants to... It, what, what's happening is that Megs is stealing stuff from the railroad and diverting it to places, or diverting cars away from Montana, but there's no way to fix this problem. And so all you can do is kind of call attention to it, and then you get in trouble or yelled at. And so what happened is everybody's becoming complicit in the cover-up because there's no other way for them to survive on this railroad and maintain their jobs. And you get situations where there are lots of forms filed, you know, uh, as to the dead, and people are talking around the issue, but nobody's actually doing anything to fix it except Dagny. And the people who want to accomplish something lower down in the system or who want to try to help solve these problems 
have no way even to get the information to her through the chain of command. They just call her, right? Her phone line has become a kind of cry of emergency signals. We don't have any nails here, Miss Taggart, and uh, uh, eventually the cars haven't been sent to uh, to to carry the grain, Miss Taggart, and so forth. So this kind of situation with the uh, employees is is really disturbing. We're also noticing something about the looters, or Dagny's noticing it, but about the progression of them. And there's a a scene, does anyone remember where it talks about the people who have once simpered such and such, then snapped such and such, and then does anyone, I don't I actually don't have that scene written out in my notes, but if anyone's got it right to hand, it's interesting. There's a progression both between how the people are saying what they say. They go from simpering to snapping to shouting to screaming, I think. And there's a progression in what they're saying. Um, that's interesting and gives us a sense of the feel of the country. Has anyone come across that scene? It's in the, you got it, Alex? Yes, yeah. I have the paragraph. So, yeah, read it out for us. What were they thinking now, the champions of need and the lechers of pity, she wondered? What were they counting on? Those who had once simpered, I don't want to destroy the rich. I only want to seize a little of their surplus to help the poor. Just a little. They'll never miss it. Later than later had snapped. The tycoons can stand being squeezed. They've amassed enough to last them for three generations. Then later had yelled, why should the people suffer while businessmen have reserves to last a year? Now we're screaming. Why should we starve while some people have reserves to last a week? What were they counting on, she wondered. Yeah, so the question of what they're counting on is one we really have to think about. But even before we get to her perspective of the counting on, look at what's happening with these people, right? They start off tentative and simpering. They then start snapping and then yelling and screaming. So they're in one sense becoming more confident. They're not tentative and diffident as they are when they're simpering. Right, but on the other hand, it's 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 not. The, they're also more panicked and nervous. They're shouting and screaming, and we can see why they're more panicked and nervous, because their range of um, their range of action is contracting. So, oh, they have so much they won't even notice if we take a tiny bit to help the poor. It's not going to harm them at all. Then um, they're more. You know, we have to take it, and uh, and they've got money to last three generations. Then it's months, then it's weeks, right? And the weeks is this Pickens mentality, right? You're not thinking about the future. You're not, um, this is this Cuffy Meggs-like or now Gene Lawson-like uh, mentality. We just grab the stuff. Um, I do want to talk about this question of what they're counting on, but let's talk more about that when we shift to Daddy's that's, perspective. Al, that's language oh, that... Oh, sorry, Ben? Well, hold on, Ben, something... I was just going to say that's language that also uh, Reardon uses when he's thinking about Philip uh, and and the looters. Uh, but uh, Al, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I also think there's a parallel between the question of what the looters want and what James Taggart wanted from Cheryl. Mm -hmm. uh, at first, you know, James, you thought James, well, he wanted her just to be submissive. I think he wanted he wanted to hurt her much more. Uh, looters, at first, they sound like. 1960s liberals. You know, we just want to take a little, you know, just equalize things, you know, help the poor. Um, but their deep-rooted hostility to success is starting to come out. Yeah, I think we need to think about, I mean, the word looter is pretty broad, and so... What, what did you say, deep-rooted hostility, and what else? He said a deep-rooted hostility to success. To toward the success. Oh, okay. so he's thinking that these looters are driven by animosity towards the successful people. And I think that's more plausibly true of some of them than others. I think some of Jim Taggart, I think that is true of, and I think we can see that. Whether someone like Miggs is, is, is governed by that is another question. Some of them might just be short-term gangsters. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Will. Yeah, but then again, we've been told, asked more than once, does it really make any difference what their mm -hmm. motives are? It says, what difference does it make whether it's being done by the greed of the Megs or the charity lust of the Eugene Lawsons? Yeah, I, that phrase, charity lust, I find to be there. Ben, you had some thoughts on, on that issue, Ted, didn't you? I did, but I think we were going to talk about them uh, a little bit later. I think it'll be easier to talk about after the Minnesota discussion. Okay, so let, let's... Um, 
Let's talk a little bit about Dan Konya Kappa first and then about the Minnesota the Minnesota issue. So just concretely what goes on with Dan Konya Kappa, right, is there's this attempted nationalization. Chile is going to nationalize the properties of Danconia Copper, which is an Argentinian company, but the Chilean properties of them, that will pave the way for Argentina to nationalize the rest of their uh, properties around the world. Once they're nationalized, they'll then be run by this uh, amalgamated interneighborly yeah. <laughs> charity, inter amalgamated interneighborly development corp. Is that it? Well, it's something like that. Yeah. Um, by this odd long-named company that Jim Taggart and Oren Boyle are invested in. But what happens is at the very moment as the, they're pounding the gavel at the meeting to uh, where this nationalization is going to be announced, we hear the sound of uh, an explosion outside, which is the local property of Danconia Copper being destroyed. And it's uh, quickly learned that Every bit of Danconia copper in the world has been destroyed or found to have been worthless. It's like when the Mulligan Bank just closed, the whole thing's gone, no fortune left. And we knew Francisco was going to do something like this. We knew he was destroying his company. He was saying when Dagny was with him in the valley, just a few more months and the whole thing will be gone. So this doesn't come as a surprise to us, but it does come as a surprise to the people states of Argentina and Chile. People states, right, is a... Is a um, euphemism for communist uh, dictatorship, right? So to the people states of Argentina and Chile. Um, and, uh, and then finally, Francisco uh, leaves to the world the message, Brothers, You Asked For It, uh, written on the pa a page of the calendar, that calendar that displays numbers over Manhattan, which now is broken and um, doesn't come back on. And... Yes, and September 2nd. Thanks, Robert. So well, we knew from Jim uh, telling Cheryl that it was September 2nd this was going to happen. Now we're on September 2nd. It was September 2nd that the novel began. The next September 2nd was uh, the wedding of, of Jim and Cheryl, which is where Francisco gives his money speech. And now we're on the September 2nd after that, right? So, um, right. Um, so uh, a year after Francisco gives his money speech, he tells them, brothers, you asked for it. Um, ben, you had a couple of thoughts on, on uh, Francisco's disappearance and message? Yeah, well, I mean, it's the first time I read this book, I didn't make the connection between the language in that calendar and the title of the chapter. I thought it was just a colloquial way of talking to call somebody your brother, maybe from the 50s. Um, but... Uh, it's it's got to be on purpose uh, since it's your, their brother's keeper, and since the you know the nationalization of the industry in Chile is being done in the name of brother love, um, and there are a number of people talking in this chapter about how they're their brother's keepers. Senor uh, later Ramirez, in the chapter, right? Is sorry, Senor Mar Ramirez, who's the dictator or leader of uh, Chile came to power on the moral slogan that we are our brother's keepers. So that's the one place where we get the title in the chapter. Right. And, and then oh. later, by the way, somebody in the chat pointed out that at the end of the chapter, when uh, Dagny's trying to explain to her workers how they're going to use this manual system, she says, yes, brother, now why should you be so shocked? Uh, I think with the same kind of attitude as, as Francisco. And there's, there's, a, there's a point that comes up several places in the chapter that that the people who uh, advocate policies based on this idea of brother love uh, are try or are, are don't want to know that this was the consequence that they were working for either the destruction of Danconia copper or you know being reduced to manual labor in the tunnels of Tagger Transcontinental um, and in this in her conversation with with James she talks more about what it is that they're trying to evade, that they had not wanted to know that it was, this kind of destruction was what they had wanted. And we'll, I think, come back to some of that when we talk about her conversation with James. It's interesting that put not as this kind of destruction was the result of their policies or even the inevitable result, but this kind of destruction was what they wanted or that this is yeah. what they wanted, yeah. right? And that is, if you, Dagny doesn't think of it this way. But if you think of, um, does that fit with that deep down they want to live, right? If this is what they want. Now, Dagny's back in the world checking the premise that they want to live. 
and we're going to see her explicitly putting these thoughts together at some point. And, but and, we can put them together now, some of them. Yeah, Ben? And by the way, it's not just this kind of destruction. Those, that was my language. The, the paragraph before where she's uh, you know, talking about what it is they didn't want to know, she, she thinks of what's happening as each is devouring himself uh, while screaming in terror that some unknowable evil was destroying the earth. Is that the same scene where he's devouring his neighbor and being devoured by his neighbor's brother? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of talk of devouring. Th those, that's in the same paragraph, yeah. So yeah, but, I, I, that, first, I, it's, I first it's you devour your neighbor and then get devoured, but then the end, the paragraph ends by each was devouring himself, which is very interesting. That's what you're doing if you're supporting a system where you're devouring one person in exchange for getting devoured by his brother. Yeah. You're effectively devouring yeah. yourself. Okay, so the one other major um, world scale or national scale disaster in the chapter that we should talk about before we move on to focusing on our characters is the situation of the Minnesota crop. So Minnesota is, at this point, the major granary in the country. The seed grain of, it was, I guess, the Nebraska farmers has already been sent away, so there's not going to be a Nebraska crop next year. Minnesota is what we're counting on as our crop. Um, we learn early on from Reardon that Reardon, what's driving Reardon, or part of what's driving Reardon, is um, his admiration for these uh, Minnesota farmers. Um, they've had a couple of bad years, they've been struggling, but now they've got this bumper crop this year, and um, for that reason, um, Reardon's been smuggling um, metal to help make farm equipment and so forth, because just the industry is in really bad shape, and they need tractors and whatever they need to harvest, carbine harvesters, whatever they need to harvest this crop. Um, and, uh, and he's doing it, and the farm equipment manufacturers are doing it, and they manage to bring in this harvest. And this is what, um, this is what the country is going to have to eat this winter. I mean, without this crop, there's not going to be anything to eat uh, this winter. Um, uh, and, you know, there's going to be starvation. So it's a really, really serious. The country is counting on this. Maybe grapefruit from the Smathers brothers, uh, Ben says. There's also the soybeans of uh, Mrs. Chalmers, the Yadamami mommy. Um, the um, <laughs> all right, so someone, one person got that pun, um, but uh, no one in New York seemed to catch it. It wasn't that good a pun. Anyway, um, there's the the or enjoy it anyway. Anyway, there's the soybeans of. Uh, Miss Chalmers from this Louisiana plant. But th this grain is really important. It's important so that there's grain to eat this summer and uh, this winter. And it's important because um, these part of the people who are going to need to, you know, have something to plant next, uh, next summer as well or next spring uh, for the next year's harvest. Um, now, what happens is, right, that, um, well, what happens? What's the fate of this harvest? And why? Well, it never gets delivered because it's overridden by uh, what Cuffy Meggs wants. By Cuffy Meggs, who sends the cars where? To Florida. To Louisiana. To Louisiana for, for soybeans, right? Uh, for Ma Chalmers soybean project. Um, and the soybeans end up getting... Uh, Pooja is excited that it's Ma Chalmers. She's got an exclamation point. Um, Ma Chalmers, yeah. Uh, they get sent uh, to California to some cooperative that's interested in privation in Buddhism. Um, and then it turns out they were uh, misharvested anyway and are moldy and they're not fit for human consumption. So the grain gets destroyed for nothing. Um, now, what's interesting is that Cuffy Meggs doesn't openly divert the cars, right? <laughs> what happens is he diverts them. Some cars still go, but not enough. Nobody's... Um, Nobody's telling us, telling anyone what's going on. Dagny doesn't know what's going on. The first she finds out about it is when somebody there says, look, we don't have as many cars as we should. And I'm getting the runaround about what happened to these cars. And then eventually she finds out and then struggles to send all the cars there. And if you think about how it works, how someone like Miggs can do this, right, you think about, well, he's making money, probably he's being bribed or something to do it. Um, but... If you have this mindset of some people have pickings and I can take them, you think, well, there are a lot of cars headed to Minnesota. And if I can divert a few to make a buck and a few more and a few more, there's still more there. But right? if you're not thinking in terms of uh, 
months and years from now, and, and uh, you just think there's a lot over here, I could always, you know, it's always possible to grab something from them. There's plenty of pickings left in, in these different parts. Um, anyway, as a result, the crop is destroyed. Everything Reardon's been doing turns out to have been for naught. Um, and uh, we end up getting the planners uh, meeting now to decide, you know, do we even want to run trains to Minnesota anymore? Uh, maybe we should just cut off that part of the country because we can't afford to uh, continue train service to Minnesota and maintain the transcontinental track. So um, there's then, well, these farmers are now out of business and unable to, uh, and the farm supply industry and so forth, and unable to uh, to continue to exist. So this um, either ends Minnesota or ends the transcontinental track, this episode, and at this meeting they have to decide which to do. Uh, Robert? Yeah, I was going to say, one of the casualties, I don't know who caught this, was Mr. Ward, mm. if you remember, who was in Reardon's office in yeah. the novel. So The Ward I Harvester Company. He was company. gone earlier. Ben, you're saying Ward was gone earlier? I think Ward was gone earlier because it's the shuttered doors of War Mr. Ward's factory that, that Reardon is thinking of when uh, he's uh, motivating himself still to help Minnesota. That was from the scene, of course, where there was a, uh, a, another Brothers Keeper uh, issue that came up because Reardon, uh, Philip had wanted uh, help back in that chapter too, and he said no, and, but he did want to help Mr. Ward because Mr. Ward uh, was, had, had some ability. But it, here it looks like that wasn't enough to save Mr. Ward, so at least Reardon wants to be able to save the producers who are left in Minnesota. And Lydia by the, the way, Greg, chat, I wanted to mention um, that, oh. that just that uh, the stakes at this point in deciding whether or not Minnesota is going to keep getting train service even after the collapse of the harvest are that there's still iron ore being mined there. And Dagny thinks they need that for the, the Eastern industries. And so cutting off Minnesota or not is making the choice basically to, to keep industry going or not. Yeah, and that reminds um, someone, I guess it's it, Corey online, just said uh, Ma Obama, so likening Obama to Ma Chalmers. Um, I do think that there, there is a particular remark of Obama's uh, that I think is... Um, interesting in this connection, and that I likened what I heard him say it to, not, I mean, Ma Chalmers is in this cast, but I think Gene Lawson and, um, and Chalmers and, and some of the other characters, which is, um, he talked about um, as some kind of ridiculous luxury, wanting to keep your home at 72 degrees all year around. I think this was in talking about fighting climate change, uh, or it might have been in some other connection. But as you know, Americans, we have we like to be able to keep our homes at the same temperature. How um, luxurious of us! And it's in the same way as Ma Chalmers talks about, um, you know, our indulgent diet that we've become accustomed to. The soybean is a a simpler food and so forth, and not so luxurious as what we all highfalutin are. And, and there's a, a kind of idea of a nobility of privations and the fact that we've become accustomed to and take for granted um, certain creature comforts, whether they're grains or whether they're temperatures or whatever, is something that we should be ashamed of uh, rather than something we should be proud of. And I think that's something that is a part of Obama's rhetoric. It was also part of Jimmy Carter in the 70s with, you know, there was an oil shortage and how nice that we could all shiver together. Um, uh, but I think Obama had more of an air of moral and moral um, moralizing about it than Carter maybe did, um, and I do think that's a, a parallel. Uh, it was a, a, the example you were thinking of that had to do specifically with air conditioning as a luxury. Yeah, that's yeah. that's why like seventy-two yeah. degrees all year yeah. round, or you know, or the heating. It's also the heating in the winter. You might you know you might think you should keep your house at. Um, 60 degrees in the winter and 80 degrees in the summer and just use air conditioning and heat, you know, on the margins rather than try to keep it the temperature you most like uh, all the time. Uh, anyway, Ben, you had some I would uh, thoughts. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say I would definitely abandon Louisiana for sure without it, uh, air conditioning, and we keep it at 68. Um, so this... This concept of the public interest comes up a lot in this chapter as the justification for 
uh, sending those soybeans to Louisiana and for sending the steel to Sand Creek, Illinois. And uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's also, I think, closely connected to a number of other concepts that are used often in the chapter, the idea of brother love being your brother's keeper, also the idea of uh, uh, deference towards need. And it's, it's important that you know, if you're talking about, it's a, Ayn Rand often made the point that if, that if you're going to invoke the public interest, there needs to be somebody who judges what the public interest is. Um, the, you know, this society is a large group of individuals and they each are good judges of their own uh, good, but it's, you know, somebody's got to make the call. And, and it turns out it's Cuffy Miggs in this uh, series of chapters. He's the sole judge of the public welfare. And of course, people have to curry favor with him. Um, and he gets vetoed at the last minute by Wesley Mouch and all the, you know, all the trains get sent to Minnesota, but, uh, uh, you know, his judgment of what was, uh, toward the public welfare had this consequence, um, even still, of course, too late. Uh, and at one point, you know, I think it was Will who mentioned earlier that the author suggests there's no important difference, uh, between the charity lust of loss and, and this gluttony of Meg's, uh, both of them have need as their standard, either Lawson's serving somebody else's needs or Meg's is uh, serving his own or the, those of the people that are bribing him. Um, and, and it makes me wonder about, especially because this plays such a role in the chapter, uh, is the public interest as subjective of a concept as the, as the author seems to be suggesting where it's, it's just totally arbitrary, you know, whatever someone like Cuffy makes decides. I mean, isn't it, I think some people, critics might say that it's obvious that the, the real public interest isn't served by uh, helping out the Smather Brothers grapefruit farm. It's not served by helping out the pinball factory that gets more transportation pull. Um, and so is, is this a straw man that the author is setting up to knock down here? Uh, though I, I guess I might add that it's maybe not so obvious that the, that the, the soybeans wouldn't serve the public interest by that uh, just kind of common sense way of looking at it. Um, but it's also interesting that, sorry. Uh, I was going to ask if anyone had thoughts on whether it's a straw man. Yeah. Uh, just, it looks like, so. did anyone uh, want to comment on that issue that Ben's raising of whether this idea that there is no objective public interest uh, is a straw man, that the public interest is just what a coffee megs decides. I agree with, yeah, with it's what coffee megs decides. Whoever's the most brutal gets to decide that or has political pull. But what about what Ben was suggesting, which is that, I mean, we're, we're given examples of what things are done in the so-called public interest, right? And it's, you know, ending industries to help grapefruit um, and uh, destroying the country's grain reserves uh, on some um, foolish and ill-concocted soybean experiment and, um, and on diverting that, metal Greg, that was needed to industries to jukebox manufacturers and so forth. Um, you might think I mean, it, that it seems like yeah, Dagny, it seems like Dagny and Reardon are are often putting things in terms of what you need to do to save the country, and that involves saving oil, copper, wheat, and in, uh, and you know making sure that transportation gets assigned to them and not to the not to the pinballs and grapefruits. And so, I mean, why isn't their understanding here a basis for you know some kind of more objective conception of of the public interest. And I have a little more to say about that, but I, I want to put that out there to see what people think. Well, I mean, it could be if there was, it was radically reconceived. I mean, what's actually in the public, if you understand it as, you know, the people who comprise a, a political legal structure, is to be left free to trade to satisfy their individual uh, desires, needs, and wants as they each see fit as they choose to voluntarily, that's in the interest of everybody. Mm -hmm. So the, the way to think of it is uh, what's the best, uh, infrastructure, the best set of institutions and rule of law structure by which to protect uh, free trade? 
It's not to have uh, it, the economics dictated by the politics, but to keep the politics out of the economics. When you have the two mixed, then you get the Cuffey Migs and Eugene Lawson's fighting over whose needs gets best served when it's a, a command control command control system. And before that, them. the Orrin Boyles and Jim Tackerts and it, Fred Kinnons, and it's yeah. going down to the Megs is now, yeah, well. Yes, I don't think it's a straw man at all, because if you're saying, this interest is the public, which, which will benefit this group, then you're, you have to say that the other interests are what? The private? Yeah, that's right. You, you wouldn't want to place your own private interests over the public, right? So that is. Right, and what you'll remember doing. that scene where Jim is afraid because he has been the public so many times. And he knows what will happen to him, but they suddenly decide, no, Buzzy Watts is now the public. Right. If the public and its magic interests got transferred to the person of Buzzy Watts. Mm -hmm. And of course, in that same scene, right, um, Clem Weatherby, who's, who's representing Mr. Mout, says, well, Jim, you know, you're one of Mr. Mout's closest personal friends. Uh, you have, in other words, Mr. Mout has a private interest in you, Jim, which is the prelude to saying, that um, therefore he's not going to help you because um, we want to serve the public, not our, our private interests. Um, ben, uh, ben? And Paul uh, on in the chat said something I think that was similar to what Carrie Ann was getting at. He, Paul says there's one and only one public interest, the protection of individual rights. And so uh, I, I take it what he's getting at is there, there might be a way of conceptualizing uh, the public interest, as in the individual right to engage in free trade, which is, I think, what Carrie Ann was getting at. And Reardon himself uh, invokes a kind of criterion for what it is he's talking about when, you know, he and Dagny are talking about saving the country. It's when they're talking about saving Minnesota. And, and he says the reason that he's trying to help them out so much is not as alms, but because he's helping producers you know, and such tenacious producers, not mooching consumers. Um, you know, and you can compare that to, you know, what both Megs and Lawson are doing, which is uh, serving just these consumers, you know, consuming at the expense of the producers, which then, you know, leads to that kind of self-devouring that we talked about before. And there's a but lot in this chapter is the sort of between ability and need, and we may want to come back to it. Even Reardon is in a weird situation. Is he, the way this whole Minnesota farmer thing comes up is he tells Daphne, I'm not going to give you be able to give you the rails I promised you because I have to send the money to this um, these uh, producers of farm equipment to save the Minnesota farms. And, you know, I mean, what use is saving a railroad if the country starves? So I have to, you know, give it to the grain because the grain is most important. And then he says, although I don't know what the use of feeding a country with no railroads is because it's not going to be able to transport food the next, you know, the next year round. Then she says, well, you know, we'll be able to last through the winter. So one thing that you see that's happening even with Dagny and Reardon, and I think, Ben, this goes to your point earlier about how Dagny's participating in this process, is they're going to a shorter and shorter time scale, right? Well, um, the reason why the Minnesota farmers need the metal and why Reardon gives it to them now is because they're going to die out sooner. And we need both railroads and farms, but the railroads maybe can make it another year and the farms can't. And so we're going to divert the money to, to, to Minnesota. But I still, I mean, we can say the only public interest is protecting rights or protecting freedom. But I mean, isn't there some sense in which Dagny's right that um, as she thinks later, you know, an industrial country is better than a non-industrial country. It's better to be rich than poor. These things are in the public interest. And it's true that you need grain and railroads to be in the public interest and not um, uh, not privations. And um, what is there to be said for this? Well, one thing I think that bears keeping in mind is the way the public interest slogan is always used, right, is as something to which other things are to be sacrificed, right? That's how we always see it used in this novel. We can't do this. This has to be taken away from you, or you can't do this, or I won't do this, which I want or which is in my good, because of the public interest. So the public interest is an object of sacrifice, that to which things are being sacrificed. But if you think about how Galt thinks about interests, the interests of rational, productive people, right? He thinks those interests don't conflict. 
So rational and productive people's interests are harmonious. And if it seems like there's a conflict of interest, it's only because somebody is being irrational. Somebody has admitted um, destruction into his view of what the proper means to accomplish things are uh, and has admitted contradictions into his view of what's possible. So somebody is trying to achieve something impossible, which can only be achieved by destruction. And then there's the question of who do we destroy for the sake of whose goals? And that Galt thinks is always impractical. So if you could say that there's a kind of, uh, um, the kind of society Galt would want and that Dagny would want, because uh, they want the same kind of society, they disagree about how to get there, right, uh, would be in the public interest, that if you want to call that kind of thing the public interest, the society is the kind of freedom that Carrie Ann is talking about, right? That's not a public interest to which other things could be sacrificed. And the kind of public interest that we're talking about, that whenever you have it, it's a Cuffy Meggs or earlier an Ivy Starnes, who's the one who decides it, is a public interest that's an idol to which other things have to be sacrificed. That depends on there being a conflict of interests. And then we think about, well, whose interests are the important ones? Those people are the ones who count as the public. Maybe because they're the majority, or they've gotten people to think they're the majority, or maybe because they're the most immediately needy, or maybe just because they're the ones who are connected in some way. Yeah, Robert? And yeah, Greg, that's exactly what uh, Reardon went on trial for. Reardon right? went on trial for what? Go ahead. For not serving the principles of the public good, the highest principle. That's what the judge yes, accused, good. Uh, accused him of. And, and Reardon said, said he wasn't. There was a person. time when the good was the moral code that doesn't mm -hmm. violate rights, but now it means you can sacrifice me for whatever you want. Good, good point. Yeah. Ben? Yeah, I was just going to say that Muhammad in the chat made a similar point to you that the 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 people who use uh, the public interest as a rationalization are often uh, thinking of the world in zero sum uh, in terms of a zero sum game. Uh, and then Dan in the chat also says it's 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 used as a cover for power games, and I think that's interesting because it it you do often in the, all, throughout the book whenever this justification has come up, it's often been transparently as a rationalization because first someone like Taggart will will give it as the justification and then when various facts about how that's working out uh, you know are pointed out he'll retreat and say we couldn't help it uh, and and you get the sense that there's some other underlying uh, reason that these policies are being pursued and that this is being used as window dressing uh, and, and we've we've I think we may still talk about some of those underlying reasons tonight I mean, there's a lot of cases of people, you know, in real life and in the novel, claiming one motive and acting on another, and maybe certain motives or claimed motives uh, allow for that. I guess Betsy gives the example I'm seeing in the chat of, um, I, I guess this is meant to be like Cuffy Meggs of Hillary Clinton uh, diverting our uranium to Russia. Uh, my understanding is that that didn't happen, uh, in fact. Uh, uh, there was a uranium company that operates in America that um, was sold to Russia, but it wasn't a matter of, at least my understanding is the uranium itself actually moving. But um, uh, surely in these kinds of deals that get a lot of political approval, there's uh, whatever happened in that particular deal, there are certainly a lot of cases of shady trading going on and uh, people collecting speaking fees, which are covert bribes. And uh, I mean, there's no question that there's a lot of this kind of thing going on, whatever particularly happened to that uranium one company. Um, um, Jean Walsh is making the point that uh, Dagny and Reardon, this is a point we were talking about a little before, are acting more like the looters and that they're on narrower and narrower time horizons, and also that they're acting more, in effect, to solve emergencies for other people. Even though they value those other people, the producers of Minnesota and so forth, they're solving emergencies that are, if this person dies, then the country's lost and we have to fix and, you know, solve their emergencies. Dagny's, in effect, running around putting out fires. And that's a kind of, or uh, it was in the last chapter, it was a, every, her whole year of work was, uh, or months of work was a zero escape, not something accomplished. And I think we see, uh, we see a lot of that. All right, let's, let's move on now to talking about um, Reardon's development through this chapter. And let's try to, to be relatively brief on this uh, and then talk about uh, Dagny's. Um, so first, uh, let's spend a little bit of time on Reardon's reaction to um, first, first Francisco's 
uh, destruction of Danconia copper and disappearance, and then the message he sends about it, because Reardon learns about the first thing first, and then then about the message, and we we get this, right, Reardon and Dagny are at dinner together, uh, we get some of Reardon's perspective on the situation, then the message comes, so we can see the before and after. So what's, um, prior to the message coming, what's Reardon's reaction to what Francisco's done? Thoughts from locals? Or, Ben, if anyone online has any thoughts? Well, first is a rather odd remark, saying, yes, he did keep his oath, oh. which is, I swear by the woman I love that I am your friend. Yeah, so... So he's somehow seeing this as being done for him. Yeah, as avenging him or in some other way helping him, which is really interesting because, it, it, I mean, he needs copper to make uh, Reardon metal. He's going to be able to get less copper now. So if anything, it's hurting him, not helping him in this, you know, immediate, obvious, practical sense. But he sees it as kind of a blow for him, a blow for justice, in the way that he did the Wyatt fire, right? And um, so he sees it as showing that he really was his friend. Um but also he's not willing to accept it as a gesture in his sake, right? Robert, did you want to add to this? Well, I was going to say, still is, he still feels bad about what he did to Francisco, and he's trying to take that action back again. So he's very conflicted, mm -hmm. because, yeah, he wants to cheer him on, but also he'd love to see Francisco, but he's afraid if he sees him of what, what the encounter would be. So I, I interpret it a little differently than that. I don't think he's afraid of the encounter. I think he, and I don't think he's reluctant even to cheer him on. I think what he's reluctant to do is accept the action as for his sake, as for his Reardon's sake, because he doesn't want to, in effect, make any claim on Francisco. He thinks, in effect, I've ruined my friendship with Francisco. I've betrayed Francisco, and, and having done that, I don't have a right to think of what he's doing as for me, even if it is for people like me, um, and then he's, you know, he, he's sad, he's happy no one will ever be able to find Francisco, he's sad, well, I won't be able to find him either, do you think he's in New York? No, well, they'll never find him, I won't find him either, but I can't look for him anyway, because, um, so he's conflicted, but I don't think he thinks something bad would happen, I think he thinks it would be some kind of insurrection, or an insur in, um, it would be wrong of him, and it would be some kind of imposition of him to expect Francisco to still treat him as a friend. Um, um, uh, uh, Megan notes online that the uh, language of I swear by the woman I love that I am your friend is very similar to I swear by my life and my love of it, that uh, I'll live for no man and ask no other man to live for mine. Um, live for the sake of no man. And uh, interestingly, Dagny, right, when Francis, when Reardon says he did keep his oath, Dagny first thinks of that oath, and then Reardon doesn't know that oath, uh, but he does know the oath Francisco made to him. Um, the other interesting things that happens in this this part of the conversation is um, Reardon says, you know, I met Ragnar Danithkjold, and uh, Dagny says, yeah, he told me, and he's a little surprised by that, right? He says, oh, yes, you would have. He would be one of them. He doesn't say one of whom, uh, what Dagny would have called the destroyer or the destroyer's agents, but Reardon's not calling them that now, interestingly. But no, he would be one of them. Uh, so I have met one of their agents. And Dagny says, you've met two of them. And he says, of course, you know, I guess I've always known it, realizing it, that, that it's Francisco. He was, um, you know, one of their best and one of their first, she says. And that night when they sent someone for Ken Daniger, I, when they got Ken Daniger, I thought they never sent someone for me. I guess I've always known it. So in some way, Reardon's either realizing or acknowledging or something in between those two, however you would put it, that um, Francisco is one of them. However, Reardon thinks of them right now. Dagny thinks of them as the strikers. Um, before, they both thought of them as the destroyers or the destroyer's agents. Now it's a little unclear how they were thinking of them. But anyway, that Francisco is one of these people. It's interesting that Reardon thinks he, in a way, always knew it. And we can tell, in a way, he always knew it because he felt careful when Francisco shows up at his office. And he related it to the feeling he had from the Wyatt fire. So in some sense, he had a... And you can know things without... Um, you can know things and be avoiding them 
right, which is what Jim Taggart is always doing and making yourself not know them. You could also just sort of semi-know things, you know, in this kind of way that you haven't put it into words yet, whether you're trying to block it or you just haven't identified it. In any case, whatever is going on, right. someone says silly Reardon. Yeah? Yeah, I was just going to mention Maria's comment. Um, and, and segue uh, from that to, uh, I mean, you mentioned the Wyatt's fire. And it, the, he doesn't, I can't remember if he thinks about Wyatt's fire uh, at this point, but he does certainly laugh out loud in the way that he did back at Wyatt's fire. And if you'll remember, that was always a, a kind of a hallmark for Reardon about, of what not to do uh, to laugh at mm -hmm. things like that. But he does it, you know, a couple more times um, during the crash of Danconia stock. And when he meets Ragnar for the first time and Ragnar tells him about this bank account that he's been keeping for him. But each of the times that he does that, he reprimands himself for this, this, this thing in him that wants to laugh and he sees it as dangerous. And if this thing in him gets, gets its way, who knows what could happen. And this time he laughs when he hears about Francisco's uh, you know, stunt, the destruction of his company. It's and not the stunt, isn't it? Isn't it he, he laughs when he sees the message? Yeah. So the he message the sign, comes up. Yeah. Right, and that's when he laughs, Which is and when he, yeah, it is a stump, but it's a different one than, the, and at that point, he and accepts it as having been done for him, right? Um, or he accepts he himself as, himself, he do, good, yeah, he doesn't reprimand Unlike himself, and, and Dagny sees it as him accepting as an act for him what he before hadn't been willing to accept as an act for him, um, all right, so that brings us to the second part of this, um, what, uh, what does Reardon, you know, do when he finds out, when he sees the message? And this is this, um, he laughs. And he doesn't censor his laughing uh, in release. And he accepts it as, uh, as for him. And Gene says, this time he laughs in public. In public. Um, and uh, uh, Corey Baum says something about, uh, or bawling, I don't know what that means. Um, it sounds like some kind of too cool language for my uh, understanding. Um, okay, um, so let's move on. Pa oh, we just say, we've mentioned earlier that what's, what's keeping Reardon going, right? Because Reardon's in some kind of conflict. He's happy that something happened that's going to end the copper supply. Um, what else is there to say about him? Um... But why is he, it seems like he's really separated from the society, and we'll see more about this later. But what's keeping him going, at least in the beginning, is this idea that he could save these copper, the, these farmers, and that it's not an act of charity. These are productive people who are doing good work. Because of that, he'll get paid. He's going to make a profit on it. Um, I don't think the point is just that he'll make more of a profit on this than anything else, but that he wants to make a profit. But it's also symbolic to him of he's doing the kind of business he's always wanted to be doing. Yeah, carry on. Yeah, I think, well, it's more than that. He does, he's longing to do real business with, with real men. But I think more than that, but he says, I'll be damned if I stand by and let these real men be destroyed by the looters. For him, if he were not participating in the way that he is so fiercely, he would be a bystander. To him, nobody could be an innocent bystander. I think mm -hmm. that's one of the premises he's not... There's something about that, that place that's playing in his argument in his own mind about why he's so resolved to stay and fight. Hmm. Um, I'm going to think about that, um, what, whether there's a view of innocent bystanders that he holds. Um, that might be right, that he wouldn't be in it, right, that there aren't innocent There's something he could do. He has the capacity, mm -hmm. so he should do it. In, in any case, that that's very likely, or I have to think about it, but it's, it's at least definitely the case that he's whatever he thinks about somebody who would stand by, he's not willing to stand by, and he doesn't see what he's doing as not standing by as he might even do it if he saw it as an act of just helping them, but he doesn't see it as an act of just helping them because he sees it as, you know, these are men, these are real men who are doing something, and, and therefore it's going to work out well, and of course it doesn't. So... Um, there are a few other Reardon topics. One is his conversation with Philip. And just as a preliminary on this, um, why is Philip there? This isn't the first good time. Good question. Yeah, it's a good question, right? We don't know why Philip is there. He says it's to ask 
At length, he asks for a job, right? Although it takes a while for him to get around to that. He doesn't tell Reardon why he's there. He looks, Reardon can't tell if he's trying to avoid him or trying to catch him, and it looks like both, which suggests that maybe he's conflicted about being there. He's shown up there a couple of times recently, having not done this. And what else is peculiar about his manner there? He's asking what Reardon feels, thinks. Yeah, it's like he's pushing, he's asking questions, always getting about them in roundabout ways. And they're always about Reardon's attitude towards business in some way, which isn't something Philip ever cared about. So Philip's got some agenda here. Um, part of it might be needing or wanting a job, although why would he even want a job? He's never wanted one before. And if it's because of the money, why doesn't he just ask for money, which Reardon's giving him anyway? So... Um, and is more likely to give him more money than to give him a job, given what we know of Reardon. Um, so, uh, so what's going on? Um, yeah, carry on. He might be trying to catch him in something, because uh, Reardon's not supposed to, by law, give anybody a job. The Unification Board is the only one who's supposed to do that, I thought. Hmm. So I think he's trying to entrap him. Okay, so yeah, one possibility is he's... Um, he's there to set a trap for Reardon. Alex? I think that he's scared that Reardon will finally cut him off because he says that you used to have a sense of duty and moral responsibility, and he realized that something has changed about Reardon since he divorced to Lillian, mm -hmm. and he's worried if he will be next. Maybe he'll be next like Lillian. He also talks about something's happened to you and what, if anything, should happen to you. What do you expect to happen to me? Oh, nothing, nothing. So there's some worry about what might happen to Reardon. Um, ben, any thoughts on this? Well, whatever it is he's there for, I, I just think it's interesting that he wants to stress that he wants a job and not alms. Now, maybe that's because he wants that job so that he can be in the factory to undertake some nefarious purpose. But at the same time, he seems to, uh, at least to me, he seems to express a kind of sincere, uh, at least offense uh, when, when Reardon, you know, suggests that he couldn't do anything useful to him um, and you know, wants the illusion uh, that he could at least, uh, as opposed to simply taking his money. And I mean, especially when you combine that with the, when, how he's thinking about uh, how terrified he is of the, of the mills without Reardon's help to navigate through them. Um, I mean, it seems like he does have an indirect recognition of his lack of ability here. And it makes you wonder what he needs this job for on some deeper level, if not just to participate in a kind of nefarious plot. Betsy suggests that he's spying, which is plausible. Um, we know that he has uh, connections to some uh, of these uh, looter people. Um, Duron, I think, answering you, Carrie Ann, um, says that he can't be trying to entrap him because he says he has friends who will fix it up. Well, but that's what you do if you were trying to entrap someone. You would uh, say I could get some illegal deal happening, and then you do it, and then you know. So I don't think that shows that he's not trying to entrap him. Um, although I, I don't myself see signs that he is. I mean, it, Reardon is doing all kinds of illegal things. Everyone knows about it and is looking the other way already. So I don't think he's hiring his brother. Um, then they know he's smuggling metals around and so forth. And the last time they tried... Because if the Unification Board told him to do it, then it would be legal. They decide what's legal. That's true. If the Unification Board told him to do it and Philip got that, then it would be legal. Plus, they all know about a lot of illegal things he's doing already, and they're not bringing him up on charges for that. So, And they know what happened the last tribe they tried. So, I, I, But anyway, it could be. Um, uh, Doron says Betsy's right. They're trying... Uh, they're planning something for him, and Philip sees that. And we do have other evidence from this chapter that they're planning something uh, against, against uh, yeah. So later on, the wet nurse says they're planning something, and they're trying to get as many of our gang into the mills as possible. Maybe Philip would be part of that, a member of our gang that's gotten into the mills, or maybe he's just spying in this conversation. But it seems like he might be part of what they're trying. Other, other signs that they're... Yes, 
Good. I say that again. I ever say that again. I don't know if I got uh, on. The divorce went too smoothly also. Good. His lawyer points out that the divorce went too smoothly, and maybe that's because they, they've told them to take it easy on him because they're trying to soften him up for something. Um, we have the wet nurse testimony. Also, even earlier in the chapter, when the California oil uh, producers go out of business because of this tax problem, um, they call him up and are assuring him and handling him with kid gloves. And Reardon's struck by that. He's not worried about the oil, but he's worried that they should feel the need to kind of be diffident towards him in this way. Uh, a causeless animosity, he thinks he knows how to deal with, but a causeless solicitude is something new and, uh, and, and a troubling sign. Um, the other thing, though, that's really striking about this conversation with Philip, right, is the the uh, the thoughts about motivation that come out uh, that come out during it, and um, we had a a question about that that we asked to the Facebook group. So Ben, do you want to kind of hit the highlights of what came out of that discussion? Yeah, uh, Betsy pointed out that Reardon is in this conversation realizing just how different Philip's motivation is from his own. Uh, Gene said a little bit more about what that motivation was that and which Reardon himself conceptualizes as, as a kind of pain-worshipping motivation. Uh, that makes you wonder, what does that mean? Is it that they want to feel pain uh, exactly? No, uh, Harry actually clears this up. He says it's that Philip doesn't seem to recognize uh, the, the possibility of real joy as an, emotional, as an emotion on his radar screen. The way he sees the world is in terms of the difference between pain and the absence of pain. And uh, it's, it's his pain that he wants Reardon to help him alleviate. And then Greg P. Uh, points out that at most this allows for an ultimate ideal of achieving a zero. You, you go from a negative to a zero. And um, uh, I think you had some historical uh, uh, allusions to make in this regard. Well, there are, one, this idea of what in some contexts Randall called reification of the zero in the novels called zero worship, um, was what she identified as one of the biggest identifications she made in the period of planning Atlas Shrugged uh, in some uh, biographical interviews uh, given in the, in the early 60s. Um, she talked about this period and what kind of new thoughts she came to um, then, and she identified this as one of a few really big things. Um, this idea of... Uh, different ways in which people reify a state of, of, of nothingness. And one of them is this, um, what Reardon calls men who worship pain. And so the idea is, right, that there are sort of two states. There's pain or problem or difficulty, and then there's a state where that's gone. And there's not a third state, pleasure, achievement, joy. Rather, achievements are removals of negatives, and positive emotions are escapes from pain. And that is a very common view. Uh, it's a common view in the history of thought. Um, arguably, it's the Epicurean view of uh, pleasure. Um, uh, I think there are versions of it in Stoicism as well. Um, it's um, arguably the Hindu concept of nirvana is a kind of non-existent place where there's no pain. Uh, I think um, it's not a you coincidence that we're getting, uh, and Buddhist as well. well. But Nirvana is both Hindu and Buddhist. Nir is it? Either way, that's uh, significant given the uh, various allusions made to uh, India and the Ganges in this chapter. Go ahead. Um, if the base of this, though, isn't it the thought, you know, a germane to what you're saying, germane response, isn't the... the the thought actually that causes one pain, it's not, I can, I can be, for example, I can be starving to death as long as I won't have to feel pain. The pain comes when I think mm -hmm. of my, I, I, I make uh, my, you say reify, I reify my situation by thinking, oh, I'm starving, but I don't well, have to, I don't have to suffer because of the There are a few starving. different ideas here, right? So there's one idea that all there is is pain in the absence of pain. There isn't also pleasure. There's another idea of how do you avoid pain? Or, or on the other hand, if you don't think that's true, how do you achieve pleasure, right? And some of the people who think that all there is is pain in the absence of pleasure 
put a lot of emphasis on the fact that you could avoid that pain by changing your perspective on things. Um, and th those are, these are two separable points about how much power does your own perspective have and power does your own perspective have. Um, okay, and that's the point that you're making. And I think, uh, but there's a... Well, very well, but I'm just making a point about okay. there's a, a historical view that Rand's talking about here, right? That's this view that there's only pain and not also pleasure. There's pain and it's absent. And then a separate question from that is whether that's true or not, um, how much control over whether you're in pain or pleasure does your own perspective on the situation have? But um, I want to focus on this first issue for now. Um, so there's the idea of, of uh, nirvana, at least as often understood. I'm not an expert in uh, Eastern religion, but uh, as, and as Rand understood it, is this idea of, of a place that's kind of a nothingness, that's an escape from or a release from all the kinds of pain you feel. Uh, Rand sometimes called this in her own notes to herself the nirvana premise. Um, and you find it in a lot of intellectuals. So uh, it's definitely in Freud that we're motivated by drives, and then the drive is a kind of discomfort or a pleasure or a lack, a disease or an itch that you have to scratch, and when you scratch it, you get release. And we're driven just by things like that, things that make us uncomfortable until we release them. I think the kind of view of motivation in the American pragmatists, who we discussed um, a couple of times has this kind of a feel to it, this kind of a flavor to it, and uh, the cognitive dissonance is the thing that motivates you. You're not motivated by wanting to get to truth. You're motivated by feeling in a state of dissonance, and then you can exercise that state of dissonance by finding a kind of resolution, in which case you no longer feel troubled or uneasy. Um, uh, to pick someone who Rand herself was a fan of, and a lot of fans of Rand are fans of, you find this idea, or at least Rand thought you found this idea, uh, in von Mises' writings about praxeology. So if you read um, Ayn Rand's Marginalia, her notes, uh, Robert Mayhew, who was with us last week, uh, edited and released a book of uh, Ayn Rand's marginal notes on a lot of books she read. And in, I forget if it's Human Action, or what, it's in one of Mises' books, Robert says it's Human Action, um, uh, he's talking about praxeology, about his view of motivation, and it's a view very much of, of this nature, that everything starts with a problem or a discomfort, and then when you get rid of it, things are okay. And she has furious uh, marginal notes on this, including Nirvana premise. Uh, so this is a view that you see quite a lot. And it's the view that's behind Philip Reardon's thinking that Reardon's never felt anything. Um, he's bothered that Reardon doesn't pay attention to his feelings. And he thinks, you know, you, I'm your brother, you know. Don't you have any concern for my feelings? And Reardon says... You don't have any concern for mine? Have you ever shown any concern for mine? And Philip's response isn't, no, I have it and that's okay, or, oh, I should have. It's just incredulity. What do you mean? You don't have any feelings. But the reason is he thinks he's never suffered. Now, what's striking about this is it's not true that Reardon's never suffered, first of all. Reardon, I mean, was, uh, we saw him in his office when his, his, all of his businesses were taken away, or many of them. We saw him flying around looking for the corpse of his lover, right? And he's reflecting on this. We saw, I mean, we saw all kinds of horrible kind of suffering that Reardon's gone through. But he fought against that suffering. He recalls the proud chastity with which he rebelled against that. And that's something we see in the heroes of this novel. Not that they don't suffer, but that they um, try not to make suffering what their lives are about. And in their moments of suffering, they try to hold on to that there's not just suffering and the release from suffering, but something else that you can achieve. Something that's a positive, not just the evasion of a negative. And what he's realizing now in his conversation with Philip is that Philip is just doesn't believe there's any other state. Philip just thinks there's suffering in the absence of suffering. And he thinks Reardon doesn't suffer much or doesn't suffer at all. And so he doesn't understand what drives Reardon at all. But Reardon thinks that this is somehow the key to or the secret to the enemies who he's been fighting his, own, his whole life. So there's something he's learning about people's motivation here. It's making clear to him how a kind of people who he's never understood and have always he's thought been against him or his adversaries work, men who worship pain, he calls them. He thinks of them as anti-living. And what's his response to noticing this? 
He wants. He, he does. He sends Philip away. Mm-hmm. What else? How else does it impact him? You said men who notice pain. Men who worship pain. Worship pain. Oh. Yeah. But what's the effect on Reardon of of coming to this realization that this is the kind of key to this kind of person that I've never understood? Is he angry about it? Is he? Feels he felt nothing. Yeah, he feels a kind of indifference. But and intellectually, he says it's monstrous. But he feels nothing about such people. Yeah, that's a really interesting yeah. pairing of. Mm-hmm. So intellectually, he thinks this is monstrous, and it's the solution or part of a solution to a question he had for a while. Mm-hmm. But he's not eager or interested. He feels indifferent, and it says something about why he felt indifferent, right? I don't have the. If, are you at the page? Because I don't have the page. Something 932 like thirty-two to thirty-three. 932, uh, well, Carrie Ann's looking at the mass market version, but uh, it's something like he couldn't... Yeah, go ahead, Ben. Uh, The same sense of detached unconcern remained with him while he... Oh, wait, no, that's the... uh, This is the one that leads into the the courtroom scene. Yeah. Um, Go back a paragraph or two. Yeah. It was like trying to summon emotion toward inanimate objects toward re- re- uh, refuse sliding down a mountainside to crush him. One could flee from the slide or build retaining walls against it or be crushed, but one could not grant any anger, indignation, or moral concern the senseless motions of the unliving. No worse, he thought, the anti-living. Is that the one you're talking about? Your mic. He regards them as anti-living and as something that you can't feel angry towards, like just objects. And that's a kind of demoting of them. And this um, slides into his, his thinking about the divorce, uh, which um, let's not say very much about, but just uh, there are other things we could say about the, the divorce episode and the, the justice of it. But the dominant thing he feels from the episode is that he's divorced not just from Lillian, but from all of society. And he feels kind of like alienated and like he's not regarding the people around him as human anymore or as fully people. And that's, I think, interesting. And I think if you look, where have we seen this kind of attitude in people before? This sort of alienation, the people around me aren't human, I can't regard them as human. Well, we've seen it in Reardon after he gives up Reardon Metal, and on that night when he meets Ragnar. Train. Other places? Then the, the train where um, Dagny's on the train, but also the, the personnel on the train, the conductor doesn't regard the bum, the, the scamp, uh, Jeff Allen is human, and Dagny has a hard but time Dagny regarding the people either. on the train as human. Yeah, good. And Dagny, um, uh, where, where else? Did you the say? common carrier, the, the, the same. Yeah, the, same so Dagny towards the people on the train. Yeah. I also think we've seen it earlier. There's a kind of being divorced from people or divorced from society that I think you see in the people who haven't gone on strike but are um, ready for the destroyer, so to speak. Ellis Wyatt lived away from everyone. He didn't want to deal with anyone. Yeah, Ellis Wyatt lived all alone, didn't want to have anyone near him. Uh, Ken Daniger, Daphne saw something about him, how he was in the courtroom that made her realize she, he was ready for the destroyer, right, and tell Eddie, Eddie told his worker friend about this. Ben Conley doesn't want to be taken out of the grave. Dan Conley doesn't want to be taken out of the grave. And, is, and there's a kind of detachment um, in the scene when he's about to quit, right? Um, now, he's not someone who joined the strike, but he's someone who probably maybe could have been made to join the strike. I don't know. Um, but there's a kind of dejection that people have. The strikers themselves don't have it. But the people who are ready for the destroyer, so to speak, who are maybe candidates to be brought into the strike, do have it. Um, and we're seeing it, you know, we've seen some of it in Reardon before, but we're now seeing it uh, on a grander scale in Reardon, uh, which might lead us Greg, to think he's yeah. ready for the destroyer. Yeah, Ben? I was going to mention this later, but I should point out that there's a similar uh, portrayal of Dagny at this point um, after uh, she sees the... Um, after the Danconia collapse happens, she's, she sees James and the other looters as being very far away, like tiny commas squirming on the white field under the lens of a microscope. She wondered how they could ever expect to be taken seriously when Francisco Danconia was possible on Earth. It's 920 of the Standard Edition. Yeah, good. 
So let's shift to Dak now. I, we should mention, though we're not going to talk about it in the interest of time, there's a really lovely scene with the wet nurse who, like Philip, asks for a job and who also doesn't get it because Reardon can't give people jobs, but um, but he says that he would like to have given him one, and that means a lot to the wet nurse. We're not going to spend time on that today because we're going to talk about the wet nurse more next week, and we can discuss that scene a little bit as part of building up to the new wet nurse material next week. But uh, it should be acknowledged, and it's a really nice scene, I think. All right, so let's shift now to Dagny and her course through this chapter. So we've already talked about her initial reactions to um, the uh, various problems in the world and the problems uh, at the um, uh, at the company. The the first we have an extended discussion with her is her discussion with Jim. Uh, Jim's called her to his office to have a conference. Uh, he wants to discuss certain particular problems in his vague and uh, and um, evasive manner. Uh, he also was trying to hold her there because he wants her to hear the radio broadcast at which they're going to announce the um, the nationalization of Nkonya Copper. And of course, what they actually announce is that the you know Francisco's destroyed it. Um, so that that doesn't go quite as he wanted. But um, let's talk about that conversation. What's going on in that conversation? Uh, let's talk about it prior to the revel- revel- yeah, revelation about Danconia Copper. Um, what's going uh, What's going on there? What does Jim want out of that conversation? What does Daphne think he wants? What does she realize about it? Um, we asked a question about this. Uh, a lot of uh, somebody says he wants to gloat. Who's that? Um, I mean, I think he does want to gloat about the national. Yeah, I, I'm. I have two places where the comments are coming up, and the one that's easier to me to see, I can't see your name, so that's why I keep saying someone says. Um, the uh, yeah, I think he does want to gloat over the the nationalization. But he doesn't just want her there to talk about the nationalization because he's asking her for something. For some, she thinks he's asking her for some kind of reassurance. Um, he's upset that he's not getting something from Dagny he wants. Right? You've been so uncooperative since you've come back and so forth. Um, what concretely does he want? What's he asking her about? He, wants he isn't her asking her about us. anything concretely. Mm-hmm. Well, he does name one concrete problem. He, he wants her views on things. He's mostly talking about the problems in general without... He's generally not a guy who goes into details, right? Mm-hmm. But he does ask her, like, for instance, what about that matter of the copper that was stolen from our warehouse? And uh, what's the significance of that? Yeah, Alan. Uh, so Cuffy Meg stole the copper. You Dag- sound just like Dagny. That's what she says. <laughs> anyway, go on. Dagny says this outright, and Jim tells her, can you prove it? But there are no establishments left that would be able to prove such a thing. All courts of law are under Cuffy Meg's control. Right, and the control of his ilk, yeah. So uh, what's his response to that? I mean, what does he want then? says, don't be theoretical. Yeah, don't be theoretical. <laughs> he wants. He doesn't say, you know, damn it, I, I know you're right. What should we do about the fact that we can't prove it in a court of law? It's, um, here's how she puts it in her thoughts. There was the form of the formless, she thought. There was the method of his consciousness. Let me pause there. Recall, he's been, she's been trying to understand what's going on with people like Jim. There's some mystery of their way of thinking or functioning that she doesn't understand. And there it is. There was the form of him. There was his method of consciousness. Continuing the quote. He wanted her to protect him from Cuffy Meg's without acknowledging Meg's existence, to fight it without admitting its reality, to disturb it without, sorry, to defeat it without disturbing its game. So what Jim wants is for her to make things work for him when the problem is Cuffy Meggs uh, and the problem is the whole kind of policies that Jim's endorsed all these years that have led to Cuffy Meggs, right? But not to name that fact and to do it in some way that doesn't disturb that fact's existence, not to like, you know, say get rid of Cuffy Meggs, but just somehow to make it work. 
Um, so that's, I think, the first point that really stands out to me from this conversation. There are a few others, and there are a, a number of the... Uh, yeah, Robert, do you want to... The other, even before that, the whole Cheryl... Okay, yeah, what about Cheryl? The of Cheryl that he ran to Dagny's apartment, which he's never done, uh-huh. and he's not taking blame, and basically she kicks him out. So, But now he's got this... But it's not only that, he runs there, he says, it's not my fault, it's yeah. not my fault, I couldn't yeah. be and yet she detects a note of glee in yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, and she's waiting for him to, he wants to hug her and plunge a knife. Yeah, so now so after so she's dead, after Cheryl's dead, he's spending more time with her, he's kind of clinging to her, and he seems like he wants reassurance from her, but also there's something like he's about to stab her in the back. And we've seen this kind of thing from him before. Um... All right, but there are some other things, too, about this conversation, and we, we asked people on the forum about it, and there were some, um, some good thoughts. So, Ben, do you want to take us through what, the, what we have from there about this conversation? Yeah, I mean, connected to the, the, his wanting to be a railroad, uh, wanting to be the president of a railroad concretely and, and her having to provide the means somehow, uh, Pooja points out that uh, she, he... He wants his desires to be fulfilled without regard to his ability, without regard to cause and effect, as though producers like Dagny are some kind of mystic phenomenon. Uh, Gene, I think, points out a related point that he sees no difference between obeying the commands of the state, that is, Cuffy Megs, and uh, obeying objective reality. This is what comes up after uh, he says, you've got to be realistic and treat things the way they are, as a matter of fact, and that's Cuffy's doing these things, although he doesn't want to name them. Uh, and David uh, says that we've seen a kind of similar attitude of equating um, the commands of men with the commands of nature in back in the, uh, the the tunnel collapse chapter where Kip Chalmers's commands are seen as the immediate and practical reality as opposed to uh, the need to keep the smoke out of the Winston Tunnel, which is what causes its collapse um, in the first place. I thought that it was interesting that uh, unlike Philip, and Dagny reflects on this fact, uh, Jim has the effrontery to admit up front that he doesn't really have uh, any ability uh, and that, uh, that it's his just plain desire to have this kind of life and this kind of job and everything that it entails that is what puts the burden on her. Um, but even though he admits this, Dagny thinks that there's still some thought that he's scurrying to avoid when he says something has to be done. Uh, there's still money to be had in the railroad industry. And it's, it's I think, that thought about uh, not wanting to admit that Megs is destroying everything, but that she needs to protect him from him. That's that kind of concrete form that this uh, point that we talked about earlier is taking the not wanting to know that what you've wanted is this kind of destruction, which is even described as this kind of self-devouring. Uh, James is really kind of brushing up very close to this, but still not wanting to go all the way to recognizing that. Uh, and he's it's certainly going he, closer to it than, than uh, Philip is. It's interesting. He says also some of what he likes about this world, right? Um I want this kind of world, today's world. It gives me my share of authority. It allows me to feel important. Right? So we're also getting some sense of what motivates him. And then he's, make it work for me, make it work for me. But um, So part of what's interesting about that is that stuff we haven't heard from Jim before. But it's also if there's something he's trying not to avoid or not name, it's not those things that he just wants to feel important. Because he is saying and naming those things. So... Uh, what's left? What is it that Jim's trying to avoid? Because he's willing to say quite a lot of things that you might think are unflattering. You know, someone wouldn't want to say about themselves. He also admits and says, um, in a way that Daphne thinks is oddly perceptive, that she's the one who's capable. She's the doer. You're the doer. You're the Nat Taggart, right? Um... You can make things work. I want this kind of world, so make it work for me. Um, we're seeing a couple of really interesting things here. He regards um, the things that Cuffy Megs has decided and certain features of the, the world as it is as a sort of absolute that can't be changed or shouldn't be challenged, and he resists when she starts questioning it, 
right? Well, coffee Meg stolen. We got to get rid of a coffee Meg. No, that's off limit. He also seems to regard Dagny as omnipotent, right? She could make it work. His things aren't working. His world, life's not going the way he wants it because she's not making it work for him. You're the doer. Why can't you make this work for me? I want to be president of a railroad. Why can't, you know, you always make your desires come true. Why can't you, you make me president of a railroad and make it work for me? So he seems to think Daphne can do whatever she wants. And that's the problem with, uh, that's what he sees as the problem, that Daphne's not doing what he wants done which means he has no understanding of or interest in how Daphne accomplishes things. She's just got this magic where she can do stuff. He, she, Daphne thinks it's like someone who sees a farmer planting weed and thinks, oh, you know, here's a genie that wheat comes from. I can arrest him or take him or do anything to him, and he'll, like, be where I get my wheat. That's not the words in the novel, but that's um, as though he's, she's a sort of magic source of production who we can capture and and have make whatever he wants. Carrie Ann, did you want to? Uh, well, I mean, this is just parallel to what he was seeking from Cheryl, and that he wanted unearned love and hero worship and admiration from her. He wants the unearned uh, fake self esteem and the unearned position at the railroad from Dagny. He's, Cheryl's not around, he, he kind of drove her to suicide. He, she's not around for him to, to do that to anymore, so he turns to Dagny for it. Yeah, I mean, in the way he always also was having Dagny for it, but he has a, a more intense emotional need for it from Dagny now, it seems, because he's not getting it from Cheryl. Now, is there any point where we get a hint of what it is that he's avoiding naming or facing? If it's not these kind of creepy things that most people would want to avoid naming or facing about themselves, because they're not too flattering. Um, Maybe it's that, I mean, he's, he's claiming that he wants something, but in all other scenes... He actually doesn't really want anything that normal people want. Like, he didn't want sex. He didn't want... He doesn't really want stuff. He wants to say that he wants it, but he doesn't really want anything. Yeah. There's one other thing, though, that happens in this scene that I am particularly find particularly interesting, uh, and I want to pause over. So recall what Dagny thinks is eventually going to happen and wants to eventually happen. Um, the looters are going to have to see that what they're doing doesn't work. And this is what Daphne's saying, you know, to Jim, right? Your plan's not working. The, equal, the railroad unification plan isn't working, Jim, is it? You're supposed to be able to get a lot of money from the Atlantic Southern at the end of the year, but they're going to have gone bankrupt, and then it's not going to happen. And that's why you're so worried. It's not working, Jim. Give up, she says, and get out of the way and let those of us who can start from scratch out of the ruins. And that's what Daphne's thinking. Eventually, they're going to see. They're going to give up. Come on, Jim, damn it. Give up. This can't work. And what's Jim's response? No. No! <laughs> and not just no. No! The explosion came. The expl I'm quoting again. The explosion came oddly now. So it's when she says give up that an explosion comes. Of no! And it's odd to Daphne that it should come now. It was, quoting again, the scream of a man who would die rather than betray his idea. And it came from a man who had spent his life evading the existence of ideas, acting with the expediency of a criminal. So this, I think, is really the key thing in this scene. We get this intense reaction of no. It's odd to Daphne. It's coming from a man... It is like a kind of allegiance to an idea. He won't give up his policy. He won't give up his scheme. Um, it's got this tremendous intensity. It's coming from a man who would rather, do, uh, who's never believed in ideas, right? He spent his a life acting, evading the existence of ideas and acting with the expediency of a criminal. And she wonders if she'd ever understood the essence of criminals. Greg? Yeah, Ben? In connection with this, I think it's noteworthy that if you remember at the toward the end of the last uh, of the Utopia of Greed chapter, when she's deciding to go back to the world, that she the reason that she gives for why she's going to go back, and I've I've repeated this a few times, but she says that she can't believe men can refuse to see that they can remain blind and deaf to us forever, and the truth is ours, and their lives depend on accepting it. They still love their lives, and that's the uncorrupted remnant of their minds, and that's of course what. Uh, Hugh Axton says, do they? Do they desire it? And that's the last premise that you need to check. Reading this whole rest of part three as Daphne's checking that. And 
she thinks that because they value their lives, at some point they're not they're going to see that this course leads to catastrophe and they're going to have to give up this course. But Jim would rather die than betray his idea. And yet he's a guy who doesn't believe in ideas. Yeah. So right now we know Reardon is farther ahead of her because he's calling it anti-living. Mm-hmm. He's farther along the path of, of that premise, which he doesn't know who Askin, Askin has told Dagny to check. Yeah, he's in a way more like uh, the strikers than Dagny. I mean, one thing that's really interesting and that I try to do every time I read this novel is try to see the kind of small shifts in Reardon and Daphne's thinking and how they're, in some cases, a little more near the strikers than they were in the last chapter, but not, you know, still there's a difference between them. You see, there's a lot of room to move. Anyway, Daphne's realizing, though, something now, right? She's realizing that this is a weird thing about Jim, and she doesn't understand it, and that she's never really understood criminals and what the essence of a criminal is, and something is connected to the fact that Jim would not, will not betray his way of life, even though he knows it won't work. And so now um, let's cut to the next big scene with Daphne, which is when Daphne's with the, um, with the planners um, at dinner. And just um, concretely, why is she there? They've asked her to this dinner meeting. Jim's asked her to come. Why does she go? I'm getting answers online. Oh, just um, Harry online is quoting something significant that um, the day might come when. Uh, so, so he's he's quoting that that um, one of the passages I I put earlier. Uh, we talked about earlier um, the Meigs made world material. Um, so this idea that Dagny's a producer, she's a doer, um, that thing Jim takes as an absolute, that she's going to produce and create. And Jim takes it as an absolute that he's not willing to challenge, that the society's going to function in this way and that Meigs will have his way and so forth. And Dagny's supposed to produce in this world regardless of the fact that it's impossible. And... Um, uh, Dagny thinks that that this goal of her producing when uh, when it's not possible to produce, right? That is um, that is what, um, in some sense, a lot of the philosophy or ideas that have been propounded in this world are for. And um, so there's a passage where she thinks the goal of all the loose academic prattle and fuzzy abstractions was a uh, quote in a passage that. Harry is quoting, the day might come when Nat Taggart, the realist, could be asked to consider the will of Cuffy Meggs as a fact of nature, irrevocable and absolute, like steel, rails, and gravitation. And um, near to that, um, there's a phrase which I really like, um, that she has, she's expected to accept the Meigs-made world as an absolute. Uh, Rand has an essay she wrote later in life called The Metaphysical Versus the Man-Made, about the importance of recognizing what facts are inherent in nature and what facts are due to someone's choices and always judging the facts that are due to people's choices and not judging the facts that just couldn't be otherwise because they're just in the nature of things. And she talks about the different ways in which people fail to do that. And Jim is an example of somebody who's rebelling against the need to do that and uh, is, ex- is, is trying to get her to accept the man-made as an absolute and to do things that are not possible metaphysically or to accept them. And it's not just the man-made by any man. It's the man-made by Cuffy Miggs. So it's the Miggs-made world. All right, but now we're skipping ahead a little bit and she's going to go out to dinner with these planners, and they ask her to come, and why does she agree to go? Uh, Robert? Yeah, she says she thinks it was their first step of their surrender, so it was a chance she couldn't leave untaken, meaning it's the first time they invited her to one of these behind, you know, backroom um, mm-hmm. gatherings that yeah. we always have. Jean Walsh online agrees. She says she thinks it might be the first step of their surrender. I think that's right. Uh, how she dressed? Very elegantly. Very elegantly. And very, um, she's not wearing too much, right? She has this. Go ahead, Ben. I mean, she's, she's uh, dressed in the soft, in something that looks like the soft folds of a Grecian tunic, which 
is an outfit that has been described one time and one time only previously in in this uh, book, and that's uh, it was the same thing basically that she was wearing when Galt saw her for the first time in the tunnels uh, back when he described was- in enough detail to know that it's the same particular outfit. I can't remember if it is, but it's at least an outfit similar. It says to Grecian. It. The word Grecian is used. You look like a Grecian okay. goddess or something like that. I searched it. This one is black. She's wearing a black um, cape and thing that just covers a little of her front. And I think that other one was like the color of water or something. Yeah, I, yeah, I recall the colors being different. Yeah. The other one I thought was some kind of blue or blue-gray, and this yeah. one's black. But anyway, they're both um, they're similar in having a Grecian kind of cut. Um, I'm not sure if the colors are different, but I, I also have that sense, Karina. Um, and she's wearing a diamond. Um, which she's, and she's doing both as this act of defiance because Jim said, well, you know, don't look too nice. You don't want to, um, you want to suggest humility, not like you're too rich. Um, okay, so she's at this dinner with them. Put the quote in. Uh, what's the quote, Ben? Then I saw that you wore a long gown the color of ice, like the tunic of a Grecian goddess. So different color, but same look. All right, so Daphne's got a style, but she varies her colors up. This one is black eyes. Okay. Um, so, um, what comes to light at this meeting? What does Daphne realize? Yeah. Well, the looters don't care about saving industry. They don't care about people's lives. And in fact, they get pleasure from thinking about destruction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good. Actually, uh, so we always have Ben writes down the best of the comments. Uh, from or the ones that he thinks most relevant to share and uh, I always decide whether we're going to go to the room first or look at those but you're saying something along those lines was at the top of our list of comments to read when we go to the Facebook comments um, but yeah they're, um, the thing that really comes across is uh, they, they're not, they don't value an industrial society and there are several other things like this but they're, they don't really want her advice first of all they just want to kind of they say things like, even Miss Taggart would accept, and they don't listen to her when she says things. Um, she's saying at this point that what she wants is to save the East, will save the industrial East. doesn't matter about the transcontinental uh, line. You know, you can have directives and push carts forever if someone's j- just, you know, subsistence farming. But if we lose industry, it, but they don't care. They're not worried about losing industry. And Lawson is kind of like excited by the idea of privations. Um, other things that we notice from the perspective of, of other things that Daphne learns about the looters at this meeting? I could mention some of the other things that people said in the discussion previously, Greg. Sure. Oh, well, actually, oh, sorry, I had two people talking at once. Uh, Iris first, and then Ben will go to the people. Uh, there's a short paragraph where the thing we already mentioned. Mm-hmm. Lawson took pleasure in the prospect of human starvation. Ferris, the scientist, was dreaming of the day men would return to the hand plow. Yeah, so they're they're not just resigned to going back to a pre-industrial, simpler way of existence. Something about them enjoys it. Already seen someone reverting to the hand plow. Yes, Starnsville. Starnsville is what they are aiming at. Yeah, they're they're and they're it's it's starting to seem like it's not just that they have policies that will lead to Starnsville, but something about them likes a Starnsville-like world. Uh, ben, is there any any of the other things from the uh, forum you wanted to bring in on this point? Yeah, and, and actually just now, Harry uh, in the chat says that he quotes the passage where she thinks that they are acting like those savages who devour the corpse of an adversary in the hope of acquiring his strength and his virtue. Though I think it's interesting that she thinks this before she goes to the meeting, because when she gets to the meeting, it it, it looks like uh, the, because of the issues you've just raised about they're not wanting to live in an industrial society, that they don't really want anybody's strength or virtue. They just want to have that power relationship uh, over them. Gene, in the earlier discussion, pointed out that uh, in, with the prospect of this, Dagny wonders how people who want something like this, who don't want to live in an industrial society, could even be human. Uh, and David 
points out that it's when she's leaving the meeting uh, and reflecting on all this that she begins to wonder what she's gaining from this struggle. What is it that's it? What is what's in it for her? She's the one who uh, thought that she's acting for her happiness. And uh, but then she says, no, I can't think of that now. And that's, I think, consistent with an attitude that she, you get from her later in the in the tunnel when she's trying to teach yeah. the other workers how to do the manual scene. We'll do it first and feel about it afterwards. But she's in this uh, situation where there's an emergency and she has to deal with it. At least that's what she, until she doesn't. And we'll talk about that exception in a moment. Um, there's one other thing that, the, 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 that I want to talk about. It, it's a version of what we've already been saying. Oh, maybe Carrie Anya, do you want to? Oh, you were uh, going to anticipate or look for, but the one additional thing, um, there were they were why they were looking forward to going back to backwards was uh, that it's easier to control people yeah. when they're when they're broken, when they have nothing to look forward to, when you squeeze almost everything that makes life worth living out of them, mm -hmm. uh, then they can just sit back and like that disgusting scene of people like bringing stuff to them, wheat tur turning into gems for them to right. like roll in, like... Yeah, the unhygienic in, Raja. It, it, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's a disgusting scene. But she sees that it's that desire for power that Ben mentioned. It's that yeah. it, th those kinds of people are easier to rule. Yeah, I think that's really important. And that's, that is the thing I was thinking of. So she has this idea that what's driving these people forward is not the vision of the industrial skyline. She thought that you know they were trying to steal industry, so they must really like industry and they value industry. But that's not what they want. And in their furtive souls, they have this vision of a way of life that they're attracted to. And there are two kind of symbols Dagny thinks of as, uh, as visions of that, one of them grosser in the way it's described than the other. One is the feudal baron drinking his brains away from... Um, from jeweled cups, and the other is the fat, unhygienic Raja of the people state of India. Um, and uh, I think at some point we should talk maybe in a supplemental episode about views of different cultures and uh, in the novel, because there's, I think there's a, things to think about about the references to the Native Americans and to the people state of India. Um, but the idea of there's a kind of primitive way of life, both in feudal Europe and persisting in India at this time, and now having regrown in the world of the novel all over the world, right, where you have people living this kind of subsistence, starvation-level kind of living, um, toiling their lives away behind a hand plow like the people in Starnesville for just a few grains of rice, and there's some baron or raja or warlord who's able to collect the couple of grains of rice from each of them and let those rice run through their fingers and gather into diamonds. And people like this are the kind of people who are easier to rule than people who live in an industrial society. And maybe that is what's driving these people towards it. Greg? In any case, uh, yeah, I We have about 12 minutes left. And I think that everything else in this section on our outline, we've already more or less talked about. So I think we should skip to the Dagny and Gold. That's what I was planning, yeah. So we're on the Good. same page. So she's having these thoughts. She's interrupted by news of a um, problem at Chakra Transcontinental. The problem is a copper wire has broken, which has been a persistent problem throughout, right? And the copper wire is taken down their um, signaling system, so no trains can be moved, and no one knows how to fix it or even what to do. Uh, they call her, and she runs and uh, comes back. And what she works out to do is no one knows how to fix it. So she's going to uh, call the people from the Atlantic Southern and get them to send the one decent engineer they've got so he could fix their signaling system and she'll bribe his way onto a plane and so forth. <laughs> and in the meantime, they're going to uh, run trains by hand, which means they're going to signal them by hand. Instead of there being an electronic system that turns lights on and off, people will stand with lanterns. Uh, in accordance with pre-written orders that they're going to go through a, a written-out program to do, and she gets uh, someone to start writing up these orders and so forth. And she's now going to go down and address the dregs of Taggart Transcontinental, these manual laborers, to explain to them what they're going to have to do, going down in her black tunic and so forth. Um, and uh, and so, well, what happens? Um, 
she finds John Galt there among like the convict labor type lowest dregs of the railroad. And then um then, you know, they she follows her, she walks off after she's done giving her instructions into a back tunnel past the little vault where his motor's hidden, and they consummate their relationship and then have a conversation. So the first question to ask about this is one that we asked online, which is why does Galt reveal himself to her then? And Ben, do you want to hit the highlights of that? Yeah, uh, Pooja said because it's about time, which I thought was a cute way of putting it. <laughs> uh, and she also, she also, she also uh, referenced the line from the Fountainhead that love is exception making. Um, and the, the chance meeting that they've just experienced is so emotionally overwhelming that, that this seems like a good reason to make an exception. An exception, of course, to uh, what Galt had said before, that he wasn't, that he hadn't earned this relationship yet, that she hadn't decided to go on strike. Um, Greg P. says that Galt wants to confess her love, uh, confess his love to her, but also to let her know that he's there uh, and will you know, take her away when she decides to go on strike. Uh, Harry points out that Galt knows that he's violated his own rules in doing this, but is willing to pay the price. And just now in the chat, Pooja asked me what I meant in an earlier discussion about how there's a particularly notable difference between Galt and James Taggart here. Uh, and it's it's just this issue. It's, it's that Galt is thinking of this uh, thing that he wants very badly, right? Just like uh, James wanted very badly to be president, but unlike James, he's thinking of it in terms of cause and effect, and he's thinking of it in terms of there is a price that he's got to pay, and he's going to be willing to accept the consequences because he wanted this so badly. Uh, and this this was, you know, the focus of much of our discussion of the Utopia of Greed chapter, where there were these various different kinds of spiritual values that all of the characters wanted, and discussion of the uh, sometimes very high prices that they were willing to pay for it. Uh, including even their own lives, um, and here we see we see uh, Galt um, putting his money where his mouth is, in effect. Um, uh, so, Pooja, that's what I was talking about. Yeah, I think there's another reason why Galt reveals himself to her now. I mean, it's been about time for quite a while. He could always go and find her. Um, why now? Why tonight? Someone said maybe she's just there among the workers, so she sees him. But he's pretty good at hiding from her. Um, why then? Yeah, Earl? Yeah, I think he uh, makes the offer to rescue her. In a half hour, I can fix this. Nothing to. Okay, so he might be, he might, he's sort of playing with her or toying with her or something and saying, I can fix this and seeing her say, no, I don't want you to do it. So maybe it's for that reason. Um... I think there's an additional one. Iris? Yeah, yeah. Uh, she uh, thinks uh, the thing that he said to her describing the first time he saw her, uh, you look like the symbol of uh, luxury and you belonged in the place that it was, was its source and I was the first man who had ever stated in what manner these two were inseparable. And uh, so it, it's bringing that back yeah, this is recreating the first moment he saw her, a moment which he shared with her earlier, almost against his will, right? He couldn't resist telling her. Um, this is the way he holds her. He's seen her lots of times since, you know, quickly running through, but here she is looking like this symbol of luxury and the enjoyment of life down here in the railroad. Um, this is his image of her, of what she means to him. Uh, this is the, and now here she is again, and now she knows he exists, Craig, and now he can have her in this moment. Yeah, Ben? I think that's important, but it occurs to me uh, that he all, he still didn't have to reveal himself to her down in the tunnel as the worker that he is. I mean, he could have, you know, shown up in a tux or something. It seems important, doesn't it, that he's stressing the fact that he's become this lowly worker? Uh, and at the moment that the tunnel system has collapsed. I mean, isn't it important that he's I mean, always all along wanted to stress that he's the one who's been working to destroy her railroad and now he's basically succeeded and this is the, this is the reality that she has to live with if, and, and he's underscoring the importance of her making a choice. 
Well, but he clearly makes this decision in the moment, the right? She sees his face. She sees the crack up of that implacable serenity that had always been his, right? So it's not like he, he didn't have time to come back and put on a tax and show up. So I do think he likes that he's but, um, revealing himself in this situation to her. It very much fits his style. But it wasn't deliberate in that sense. He saw her there and decided in this moment to, to do. Oh, Carrie Ann? Yeah, but you yeah. yourself said a, a minute oh, hold ago on, that he that? doesn't, he, he's very good at hiding. Oh, sorry, and Ben. He, could, he didn't have to come to the meeting. Yeah, he's good at hiding, but I mean, he's deciding in this moment that I want the, us to have this moment together. Um, it's not like now seeing her wore him down and he thinks, oh, I've got to have her later tonight. Um, what he wants is to have her in this moment, in this place, um, uh, as the completion of, of this scene from those years ago. At least that's how I see it. Carrie Ann? Uh, uh, well, I suppose him, he, he may have just grasped very clearly that at the perceptual level, I actually got an image of this glorious image of a statue in a place where it sh is the place it really shouldn't be. And she's going to have to keep that image in her mind. It's toward the end of the chapter when she's like, where are you going now? After they make love, he says to be a lamppost and stand holding a yeah. lantern until dawn, which is a beautiful mm -hmm. metaphor for him waiting for her to come to yeah. the realization, which is the only work your world, your world that you chose to have me to stay in, relegates me yeah. to and the only work it's going to get. Yeah. So she has That's to part of what I was thinking. keep in her mind the image mm -hmm. of him holding manually yeah. to be reduced to a lamp post, a human lamp post. And she's, that's what she has to see firmly. That's what her actions are leading to, keeping him there, where, the place where he absolutely shouldn't be. So I agree with all that's of these of things that he likes, he likes this emphasis. Um, that he likes her seeing him in the lowest place and that that's something that's not. But he would not have risked his life just to make that point. He's risking his life to sleep with her here and now. After waiting all these years, when he could have shown up and slept with her a bunch of times, he thinks she would have immediately known what he is and wanted him, right? And she thinks that too, now that she's met him. And for months he's been hiding and she hasn't come. There's something about this moment that was too much even for him. And he decided in this moment, I'm going to claim the award. Now, I think all of these things are part of it and part of why this moment means so much to, to him. But part of it has to be that it's the recreation of this first time. And then it's the recreation of the first time in a context where all these points can be made about it. All right, so then we have the love scene between them. We have, though I don't want to pause over it, um, because there's not that much new to say about it and because of time, there's a tremendous emphasis on mind-body integration in this sex scene. Um, she's feeling these physical sensations, but here's what they mean to her. Um, it was only the sensation of a hand on her, but it contained all this other stuff. Her, uh, her body became a means of experiencing um, all these incredible abstractions and her whole life course through these sensations. Um, and then we get, after, after the sex scene, a kind of debriefing between them, right? So Galt tells her... Um, this is how I've watched you all these years, and I've never been able to see, you know, I never had you close. You were always running, rushing by quickly and so forth. Um, we learn for the first time, although we might have uh, inferred it before, that Galt was the figure outside the John Galt line office, right? And he was struggling with whether or not to come in. And we also learn explicitly now that Dagny now thinks that it was Galt who she was thinking of then, although she didn't. Uh, know it, so the end of man at the end of the railroad tracks, that was the first time we got that image. Um, and we get two other things from Galt that I, that I think it's worth our naming. Um, one is his perspective on her and Reardon, and his having learned about it, and the other is his perspective on what's, what's needed going forward. Um, so any thoughts, um, Ben, on the, the Reardon stuff? Uh, did you want me to ask the, the question that I had about this part? I don't know if you want if to. If you want to, or we should. Where are we? Well, I guess I can. I can do both. So you're talking about how Galt reveals how when he first found out about uh, their relationship, which we know now uh, how he found out about it because um, we know that he's been worked well. There's some We're assuming we know he's the worker. Uh, 
we are we i didn't know which work which work are we assuming Weeks ago, we've decided, or so uh, Robert says, and I think he's right, that that Galt is the guy Eddie's talking to. Okay, okay. I, I, I mean, I've been called out for spoiling this too soon by important people. So, yeah, so we found, we, he finds out uh, that Reardon's with Dagny because of the conversation with Eddie. Uh, and that's why he leaves the table so quickly, um, which surprised Eddie. And here he describes um, what he goes and does. He goes to this uh, to see Reardon, who's having this business uh, conference. And at first, he uh, has a kind of temporary uh, jealousy for his position in the world. This is where Galt could have been. And uh, but then he realizes that he's seeing things out of context. He's not remembering uh, all the the prices that. Reardon is paying for this, all the torture that he's enduring um, at, you know, because of all the other people who are surrounding him. Uh, and it was curious to me that this issue of context came up a couple of times in this chapter. This was one. The other one was in a scene that Tom in our earlier discussion pointed out where Dagny's coming from the meeting and she sees this reflection in the window and it's, uh, it's, she doesn't realize at first that it's herself. And just like Galt for Reardon, Dagny has this sudden admiration for this figure that she sees in the mirror, uh, but then captures the context of what's going on and remembers, not, notices not only that it's her, but remembers everything that she's dealing with. And Tom uh, had a really good way of describing this, that, uh, that uh, you know, she, she doesn't realize, and actually I've lost a ticket of point that Tom made about it, but it was... Uh, like she doesn't realize that, that, that oh here it is um that uh on realizing it was a reflection she feels a stab of desolate loneliness i see the scene as an analogy to what's going on in her mind with respect to the premise that people want to live she continues to hold this premise but in reality it's only a reflection or projection of her own premises uh in other people which i thought was a really good i think that's a point. good point and, that tom makes about dagny's uh dagny's situation generally um, and the question Ben you were asking is 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 Galt so Galt goes to see Reardon for a moment he's jealous of Reardon right Reardon seems to have everything he wants and to be everything he could be or could have been if the world were as it should have been um, and um, I, I really like Tom's point about Dagny and seeing her own reflection um, I don't know if um, if Galt's point about dropping the context and seeing Reardon that way is meant to pick up on Dagny's having seen her own reflection, but I do think it's true that they're similar things. So Galt says he did in that moment what most people wreck their whole lives doing, which is see moments out of context. And, um, and that Galt did it in that moment shows how important this was to her and how big a challenge it was realizing Dagny was with another man. But um, he then puts it back into context. He sees that Reardon's really suffering to realize what he, Galt, knows, that Reardon is really the symbol of uh, the victim that Galt is avenging um, and that it's right that Daphne should be with him and that it doesn't change anything. And importantly, Galt knew about this before he met Valley, Daphne in the Valley. And it's, uh, he, but it's not only, you know, he just learned about it, right? Uh, I mean, what happened is Galt learns about this. He goes to see uh, Reardon, I guess, the next night. And then he flies, um, you know, a day or so later to, uh, to the Valley and um, picking up Quentin Daniels along the way. And then meets Dagny. So it's very, very fresh in Galt's mind uh, when he first uh, meets Dagny in the valley. The other thing that I think we should note about uh, about Galt's perspective on all of this, um, I mean, he talks about that he does suffer from this. He suffered then, and he suffered uh, when struggling about whether to go in to see Dagny in the office, but he knows not to place too much importance on suffering. The suffering is to be fought against. And someone on the chat, I forget who, brought this scene up in connection as a contrast to Philip Reardon's perspective on the world, and I think that's definitely right. Um, and the final thing is um, someone on the chat just um, said that maybe what Galt is thinking that leads him to go to Dagny or to reveal himself to Daphne, is that maybe now she's ready to go on strike. But that can't be right um, for two reasons. One, what she's doing is trying to continue running the railroad. Uh, and two, he says, you don't have to tell me, I know you're not ready to join me. 
But there's a consequence to her not being ready to join him, which is that he's taken her before she's fully his, before it's safe to, and he broke his own decision. And this is the point, Ben, you were making about... Um, Ben's just disappeared. The point, the point, Ben, you were making about um, he's doing something, he's paying the cost for it. And uh, what he had sat and decided to do was wait for Daphne to go on strike, and then they would be together. But he's decided to go to her before she is ready to go on strike. And an effect of that is that he's putting himself at a great risk. Um, now she knows where he is, which she didn't know before. And he thinks she's, she, he thought since he went back that he was risking his life by going back. Daphne now knows about the strike, knows about him. Um, she is somehow going to be able to lead his enemies to him and is going to have to do it if she doesn't reverse course soon enough. And he now is worried that that's going to happen. Uh, and he tells her, and he says, if I have to die because of this, so be it. It was worth it. Uh, and then what he says to her is she's going to have to do what he's done from now on, know where he is, but not come to her. And when she's ready to strike, she'll sketch a dollar at the base of the statue of Nat Taggart. The next chapter is called The Concerto of Deliverance, so it sounds like someone's going to be ready to go on to strike. So stay tuned for whether Daphne sketches that dollar sign symbol. Uh, and uh, New Yorkers, I'll see you online, I hope, uh, next week, but see you again in person uh, the week after that. Uh, we're going to go live next week to discuss Chapter 6 from uh, with me from Boston. Ben will be in New Orleans, as always. And um, then back here for Chapter 7. Ben, any last words? Uh, no, that's that's good. Uh, look forward to seeing you in a, in a new location. And uh, I'll, I'll actually be coming to New York uh, in just a few weeks again. Um, we decided when? All right. Good. Well, goodbye, everyone, and thank you.